Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Lynn O'Hara, and I'm the Director of Programs at National History Day. We are excited to join you for our next installment. This is actually our fifth episode of our Teaching History Virtually series. And I'm so excited today to be joined by Whitney Hain and Ken O'Regan from the White House Historical Association. We work at NHC and the White House Historical Association. We work back and forth on many different programs, um, online programs. We've done written work together. We've cross presented at, uh, they've come to the national contest. We've gone to the White House Teacher Institute and they're good friends of History Day and we're so excited to have you join us. So what are we gonna be talking about today? Today's goal is gonna be taking a look at presenting new content online and trying to figure out different ways to look at assessment. Um, kind of like we've been saying all along, there's no one size fits all here. There's no right answer. We are all in uncharted territory. Our goal with this series is to give you some strategies, to give you some resources, and hopefully spark some ideas. Because we know that not every idea or every resource is for everybody, especially right now. I'm gonna keep reminding you to focus on quality over quantity. And you know, our students are in a really tough spot. So we've gotta throw in some of the fun. And I don't think fun and learning have to be separated. And I do think that students respond to you when you're engaged and excited and you are like, wow, this is the greatest activity. I am so excited to do this today. Even the grumpy ones kind of pick up and start to come along. But what we also wanna make sure we do is answer your questions. Uh, there is a hand raise feature in Zoom, but it doesn't help us, please don't use it. Uh, what we want you to do is put questions you have in the question and answer box. Ashley is tracking them. We're gonna present for about 20 minutes or so, then we're gonna go live for Q&A. If you are watching this on a mobile device or on a tablet and you don't have access to a Q&A box, you can go on Twitter, you can tweet the question to National History Day and use the hashtag NHD2020. Rick Stoddard, our Director of Communications, is monitoring that and will pass those off to us as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the learning environment you're in. You're probably either putting materials out or preparing to put materials out in either a synchronous environment or an asynchronous environment. Two words that a whole lot of Americans know right now. So if you're synchronous, you're going live. I have to be honest, when I teach our online classes for National History Day, we don't use a whole lot of synchronous learning and we don't because of the time zones, right? I've got teachers literally stretching all across the United States, Alaska, Hawaii, into Asia, and literally, um, you know, in the Middle East, all around the world. And synchronous sometimes works and sometimes doesn't. When you do synchronous, like we're doing right now, please, if you have the option to record and save for students who can't join, absolutely exercise that option. When you go live, make sure to bring the spirit of your class to it. When you're teaching for a while, your class gets inside jokes, right? There's funny things that you say and that you do. As a teacher, when a student would give a really good answer, I would make a big deal and I would go, you know, ding, 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 great, that's the great, that's what I'm looking for today. Bring that spark and that personality when you go live because students are responding to it because they respond to you. My suggestion when you go live is don't go with this ability to think that you have to lecture or go straight to direct instruction models. Because I really think that you need to focus that time because it's limited with a concept or idea your students will struggle with. And I think what you wanna do is really think about how to do that. Now, I'll be honest with you, since we're working with White House Historical, I'm gonna use a lot of presidential examples today. But remember, you can flip out this content with any content you have. So I think one of our teachers in the pre-session mentioned uh, Andrew Jackson. Well, Jackson in the bank was something my students really struggled with. They didn't quite understand what was the big deal and who wanted it and who didn't want it. So if I were trying to do that right now and I had a live session, I would divvy students up. Hey, you're a farmer. Hey, you're a merchant. Hey, you're part of this group. You are the secretary of state. You are. And then we'd talk through the problem. Why would we want it? What's the difference between gold and silver? Do we have paper currency? Should we have paper currency? Who would want that and who wouldn't? And I would really kind of talk through it and get the students to respond. And I think one advantage of the synchronous learning is to say, okay, you know what? I'm gonna sit back and I'm gonna stop. And I'm not gonna continue until I get at least two good questions. And be prepared, you're gonna give 10 to 15 seconds at least, and maybe even a minute of wait time. Some of your students are gonna think, hmm, if we just sit here and be quiet, she's not gonna continue, she'll just continue. 
don't do it. Give them time to pause and reflect and respond back. What I would find as a teacher is once one student asked a question, then four or five other hands would go up. And make sure we, we're good at doing that live in the classroom, but if you're going synchronous, give time for those questions as you're live, because I think that's really important. If you're working in that asynchronous environment, think about what you're putting out. If you're putting out videos or recorded content, think of length. I want you to think for students, five to eight minutes. Adult learners, 10 to 12. Try really hard not to go over that. Once we go over that, people stop listening. Um, nobody really loves their face on camera. Nobody ever really loves their voice when it's recorded. Get over that. Don't worry about it. Um, I think your students want to see you and they know that you don't look perfect and that's okay. You might even surprise yourself. Um, the first time I ever flipped a lesson and I did something that was recorded, my face wasn't on it, but my voice was. I actually had a student come in the next day because I worked with another teacher and they said, well, okay, the other teacher did the first one, then you did, who did the second one? And I looked at them and I said, well, that was me. And they go, that doesn't sound like you. That sounded like a radio announcer. So you might have a hidden talent you don't know about. Also, as you're recording, ignore imperfection. When you speak, we sometimes stumble over words and we get something wrong. That's okay. If you did it live, you would correct yourself and keep going. Students wanna know that you're not at this perfectly either, and that's okay. Um, I think other ideas you might wanna be able to do, sometimes you can mix things up. Uh, if you can use clips from documentaries, access through one of the streaming services, or if you have DVDs and can rip a segment off, use that as a way to deliver some new content or review some content, but really focus on connections. All right, I thought I'd throw a couple ideas out there of some ways to kind of look at instruction. One thing I think we have a great opportunity to do is to do some problem solving lessons. And my students were always fascinated with the Iran hostage crisis. And a lot of students really are, it kind of hits a sweet spot. It's just old enough for them. And what I would do is I was working with some older students, I would choose a time period that I wanted them to learn and I would give them a scenario and then ask them to advise the president. Now, this is a great way to bring in primary sources. And if you're thinking like, man, I don't have time to find these, don't worry, organizations have already done it for you. I would go through and do a little cherry picking and Whitney and Ken are gonna share a whole bunch of resources that will give you materials to use to cherry pick for something like this. Give the students a scenario, give them a date, and then have them have a meeting, whether it's a live synchronous meeting, whether it's a discussion thread, whether it's they're gonna write up their recommendations where they have to quote from a primary source and send it back. But give the students that power and that agency. Because I think when we think about presidential history, we think about the guy at the top, right? But the reality is so many decisions and recommendations are made by a large group of people who work underneath the president. And that's kind of a neat way to do it. Another fun way, I used to do this in my classroom. We did a presidential final four. This is March Madness time, right? Typically, and I, I would roll this out about March in that I would set the students up and I would you know, say, okay, let's set rankings and brackets. Now, if you're not a super sports fan or a sports better and you don't know how the bracket system works, don't you worry. There are teenagers in your classroom who do and they will set it up. So what I would do is I would set the students up and I would say, okay, you got to create your brackets, brackets and you've got to rank. So who's the highest rank one and who's the lowest rank one. Set up the matches, highest meets the lowest and it goes in from there. Uh, limit the number of buys. And what I would do literally is give the students, set them up north, south, east, and west, and they had a set of presidents. Now, purposely, I don't have Obama or Trump on the list. And I would do that intentionally as a teacher because I think too much of the issues the students would focus on fit more into current events and less into history. So that means there's buys in both the east and west regions. Let the students bracket them up and then let the students debate each other, say, okay, if I'm gonna put in the first seed, Harry Truman versus James Madison, I'm gonna decide who's the better president, but I can't just say, oh, it's Truman. I have to be able to give clear reasons and evidence to support my theory. I'll give you a heads up. I've done this a couple times with live students and Lincoln is the man to beat. 
But I think that that's okay because what I would then do at the end after we had debated it out and I'd have it on the board and we'd get it down, I would say, okay, so why Lincoln? When you really look at all the presidents, what are the reasons why in your minds Lincoln is standing out? And is there anybody maybe who got overlooked in the process? And it leads to a lot of really interesting discussion in your class and among students. And it lets some of those kids, you know, who are really into the sports have a little game. Another review strategy I would do is presidential pages. Give each student a president. I know some of you are trying to figure out how to review uh, to get ready for those AP exams coming up. So I might give students a task where I divvy them up and give each one a different president or maybe different terms of presidents, depending on how many students you have and how far you want to cover. I would want a one page review guide. In there, I would want them to mention 10 major events that happened. I would want them to integrate three different images, whether those be photographs, historical images, or even stick figure images. I would tell students to put one idea in there to make us laugh, put a joke, make it funny, find a funny cartoon. A little humor doesn't hurt anybody. Also, I would give them a little piece. I would might give them a 50 word analysis of the president's leadership style. I might tell them to give a 50 word so what paragraph. And again, these aren't long. I wouldn't want a whole page of just written paragraphs, but I would use that one page maximum. You could easily then take students work, put it together in a PDF and create a great review guide that your students created for each other. That could be a really easy tool to use to get ready for an AP US history exam. And again, if you're teaching AP Euro, if you're teaching world history, if take this idea, change the topic, same strategy can work. All right, assessing learning is where it gets tricky, right? Because honestly, a lot of our bag of tricks doesn't work so well in the online environment. A lot of the standard kind of tests and quizzes, formative, summative assessments, they don't really work here, right? You can't control the environment. You don't know what's going on. So I would shift things that might be quizzes into challenges. Hey, can you get 80% or better on this activity? Make it a challenge. If, if it's not about getting the grade and getting it perfect, can you get it? Can you get it in the fastest amount of time? The first student to get this done at this level gets a bonus. Can you take it and kind of shift it? Um, we're not grading in the same ways. Most people that I've talked to are have kind of shifted into some kind of a pass fail or credit, no credit mode. But we still need to kind of think about options. Do we have options for students to either work solo or collaborate? Maybe there's an activity where, hey, if you can work with a friend over the phone, great. And if you'd prefer to work by yourself, that's okay too. Um, I used to use a concept I would call block projects when I taught in a block setting. A block project is, a, is an activity that's designed to be completed in one block, which is 90 minutes or less. Here's the task, here's the resources, I'm here to help, you go. So think about things that can be created in short periods of time. Students can do it right then and there and submit it to you right away. That takes away the piece of having to go home, work on it on their own, get stuck, run into a resource problem and kind of make yourself available. Hey, you know what? This we're going to do between 10 and 12 p.m. And I'm going to be available and I'm going to answer any questions that you have in this two hour window. And your goal is to get it to be my goal. Another strategy, quick writes, right? Long extended writing, that's a real challenge right now. But can you do some quick writes? Can you pop up a primary source? Can you pop up that primary source and ask a question? Or ask students to create their own questions? Or ask students to connect it to something else? And quick writes can be simple. They can be tweets. They can be responses on a discussion board. They can be, hey, here's a primary source we looked at before. Make me laugh. You'd be surprised, throw in a little creativity. It's really neat. Um, couple things to think about as you're assessing work. Realize what your threshold is. What do you need students to do and what can you let go? If you're using rubrics, be really careful how you write them. It's hard to give feedback when you can't actually talk to the students or review it live with them one-on-one. -on -one. So if there is like a line, like, okay, you've got to get to this point, Make it very clear exactly what students need to do so the expectations are clear to them and to you. Give a lot of praise, give a lot of support. Our students really, really need it. Okay, 
two quick things. I know, I'm sorry, some of you have heard this before. Uh, two fun things that I know are happening this summer. Our historical argumentation webinar series is going live. Applications are due by May 1st, and we'll be picking 58 teachers, one from every NHD affiliate to join us. Uh, that's going to be a whole lot of fun, and those programs are going to go live in June. And our online education courses are open and taking registrations for both summer and fall 2020. Again, these are online, so they're happening. All right, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pause my screen share and flip things over to Whitney Hain and Ken O'Regan from the White House Historical Association. They're going to give you ideas about resources, hopefully give you some fun ideas. I know I get fun teaching ideas every time we talk. So Whitney and Ken, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and Lynn, uh, I think you had some great ideas and I think we have a lot of great resources that can kind of um, pair with those ideas. Um, so if you don't know already, um, we are the White House Historical Association. We're a private nonprofit and we have a mission to protect, preserve, and provide public access to the history of the White House. Um, so Ken and I do that through working with um, K through 12 teachers and students um, and kind of creating online uh, you know, content for you guys because while the White House is in DC, we have a mission to kind of spread the history throughout the nation. Um, it's a symbol for all of America. And so we've been um, really working hard at that. So, thank you. So um, just wanted to start off, you know, by kind of thinking like, I know this is a difficult time. And I think the thing though that has shown me is the diversity of resources out there and the different topics and things. Um, Lynn said, none of this is a one size fits all time period. So um, with, you know, education and working remotely, um, it's kind of fun to explore new things. And I've been kind of excited by the creativity that I'm seeing from the museum education community, from the teachers like you who would be in the classroom, but now are doing things digitally. Um, and these are just some of some fun things I like to share. Um, the White House, again, we always think it's presidents, but there's a lot more going on. Um, you can explore things like technology. Um, this is a image of a switchboard at the White House from 75, and they actually used that switchboard until um, 2002, um, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> um, then there's, in the middle is uh, Pushinka the dog. Uh, if, you know, if you think about it, that's actually about diplomacy. So Pushinka was given by the Soviet Union um, to the Kennedys. Um, and then Pushinka and the Kennedy's dog, Charlie, ended up having puppies and they named them Pupniks. So, you know, tying to space exploration to the Soviet Union, the Cold War, um, there's a lot of kind of fun little moments and stuff you can dig into. Um, here's just a beautiful spring picture from uh, the Rose Garden. And then I also love, we always talk about Hamilton today, um, but there used to be, and there still is, 1776, which was a play in a movie. Um, it actually was performed at the White House in the East Wing um, during Nixon's administration. And we have some really cool pictures on our digital library with that. So there's a lot of kind of things to explore and history to explore. Um, and we have a huge um, swath of resources that we currently have. Um, so there's 30 resource packets. And I think these are really great um, starter things for students. They're just um, an essay that's like three to four pages, um, double space. Then there's some images and primary sources and then some um, activity ideas of how you could use it. But it's a great kind of quick overview of things from roles of the president, roles of the first lady, technology at the White House to fun things like first pets and first kids. Um, we have short educational videos. Lynn mentioned these are like less than five minutes. Most of them are three minutes. Um, and they're from some of our historians, um, an author, and then even one is from a former White House staffer. Um, we're also being creative and um, adding new Anywhere activities. So these are fun crafts that you can pair with those resource packets. Um, we're always working on NHD starters. We're um, starting now to think about our 2021 stuff, which is exciting. Um, another really great thing, and especially if you're having your students do things with presidents or first ladies, um, we have a mobile app that's called WH Experience, and in there you're able to um, you're able to you know tour the White House through images. We've just added a new kids tour there, but also there's a selfie feature to figure out what first lady or president you look like. Maybe your students can research that first lady or president if they find out that they match. I always match with uh, Chester Arthur, Arthur's wife, Ellen. So you know, learn new things every day. Um, again, if your 
students have the ability to use technology. We also have a chat bot online. That's also an Alexa skill. If you ask her to do White House history, um, a helper, she'll kind of, she'll can answer some questions about the White House. We have a digital library that has thousands of images um, that I just showed you some of them, but there are thousands of images from the White House, um, objects from the collections. Um, we have three full-time historians on staff who are always writing articles. Um, we even have a children's book list, depending on what grade you're teaching. Um, these are more kind of elementary and um, picture books and stuff, but there's some really great thing, concepts that can get out in those books. Um, and then our president of our association does a podcast called 1600 Sessions. And um, he's interviewed historians, authors, and even people like uh, Linda Johnson Robb, um, who is the daughter of LBJ. Um, and she talks about her wedding at the White House and what that was like and stuff. So there are kind of fun ways to get involved. All of these things are free to use. Um, you can go to our website at whitehousehistory.org slash education. Just wanted to do like the quickest overview of all that stuff. Um, but what can you do with all this stuff? I think one fun thing is looking at change over time, um, having your students maybe pull images from the digital library. Um, this is an image from um, the last kind of five years of the Blue Room and then looking all the way back to around the Teddy Roosevelt administration of the Blue Room. And I was able to just through online stuff, knit these two together. It wasn't any special programming or stuff. I just kind of cut and paste things. Um, also, uh, have your students explore their interest and hobbies, but in history. Maybe they love cooking or baking. I think a lot of people are doing some uh, baking at home. I know I am. Uh, and we actually just recently added the Henry Holler collection to our digital library. Um, he was the White House executive chef from 66 to 87. Um, and we have his menus from various state dinners. You can see this one over here was from when Queen Elizabeth came. Uh, he's out in the garden. That's him in the middle. Um, the other picture is from Trisha Nixon. That is her wedding cake from when she had her wedding out in the Rose Garden. Um, and so he, that family was able to provide us and we've digitized all these images, these programs, and kind of his experience working at the White House and being a part of, you know, the presidency and diplomacy with your state dinners but exploring it in a way that is kind of more fun and interesting and something relatable to students, especially when they're at home. Um, and if you keep checking back with us and you're on our email list, we're having one of our Anywhere activities, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, is going to be a recipe from one of the former pastry chef. He gave us his uh, peanut butter and jelly cookie recipe. And so we're gonna attempt to make that and then share it with you guys. So. Um, I think that will be fun once that comes out. So those are just kind of some ideas, but I also wanted to share something we recently released, which uh, if you're interested in any president, uh, you can go on our website, find tons of resources, but there are also so many different places that are um, kind of having online resources for you available. Um, you don't have to create them yourself. Um, so what we did is we actually created a hub for all these online resources for every president. Um, we did not include Cleveland twice, he's just there once. Um, but we have from the National Archives, from national park sites, from state historic sites, independent museums and homes, um, every president you can go on that now and find at Sharing White House History. We really feel like the thing that connects all these presidents is the White House. Um, all of them have lived there except for George Washington because it wasn't finished when he uh, left his presidency, but he did select the design and site for the house. So. Um, we're really linking and trying to um, knit all of these together. And if you guys have more suggestions of sites that we don't know about, please let us know um, and contact us. We're always looking to kind of add to everything we're doing online right now. We're really here to help you guys. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ken to talk about a few more things. Okay, let me, uh, let me try and do this as gracefully as possible. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I want to start my show. Uh, can you see my screen here? Yes. Okay, great. can you, s all right, great. We're good, we're good, everyone has me for finding new voices in White House history. Um, so I'm here to discuss some of the different approaches that we've taken as an association um, to kind of helping to build this larger narrative of White House history and um, inform, inform all of these resources that we've made available. So when we're discussing the White House, we 
I'm going to go back to this slide. When discussing the White House, um, we traditionally look at it as, well, it's the seat of U.S. executive power. It's the official residence of the president. We think about the West Wing and all of those things. But with all other things in history, there's a lot more to the story than that. This is not just a one-track approach to, to White House history. Um, there's many stories in the White House. There's many voices. Um, and a lot of important things that happen that go far beyond the Oval Office or the press briefing room. Um, so we work to share these stories uh, being told by both individuals as well as objects and art and the events that take place at the White House. Um, so if you were to ask your students, okay, who lives in the White House? Pretty much all of them are gonna shoot their hands up and say, the president, of course. Um, some people might also include the first family or the first lady. You could say, who works in the White House? And they'll say, well, the president or the president's staff. Um, so it's a lot more than just this vacuum of press reasons and official events, but a complex place of interwoven stories and real people. Um, and it's stories that aren't really often appearing in textbooks or in the past really haven't appeared in textbooks. Um, we look at a number of sources which I've listed here for these stories and for this information that we're using to um, inform everything we do at the association. You can start looking at first ladies, of course, that would be a, a great place to start. Um, first ladies have contributed mightily to White House history um, throughout the entire existence of the presidency. Um, some first lady stories are really well known, like those of Eleanor Roosevelt or Jackie Kennedy. Um, but there's a lot of other first ladies who have had lasting impacts like Edith Roosevelt, who played a major hand in the construction of the modern East Wing and the reorganization um, of the White House on like a almost, you know, a structural level to make it an efficient home and an efficient office um, to house their very large family during the Teddy Roosevelt administration. Um, she also hired the first social secretary. Um, moving forward to Rosalind Carter, um, who created the official office of the First Lady. Um, we can also look at first kids and first families as a whole, shaping White House history. Um, one of the stories that we love to tell at the association is about Teddy Roosevelt's children. Um, you know, they did a lot to make great fun of their time in the White House. There's many stories about those, those kids in the White House. Um, but the older boys once brought uh, Archie Roosevelt's pony upstairs to his second floor bedroom in the White House um, via an elevator to visit him while he was sick. So absolute hijinks, um, but something that, you know, kids and students love to hear about. Um, as Whitney said, uh, Linda Johnson got married at the White House. Um, also, Susan Ford had her high school prom at the White House in the East Room. Um, so these are some stories that show the White House not just as an office, but really a home where there's a lot of things happening um, that could be happening in any house in America. I hope your students aren't bringing horses inside, but you get the point. Um, so presidents and first families come and go, uh, but White House workers, the, the kind of full-time staff that's always in the house, um, a lot of them stay from administration to administration. And they keep it running, the White House running as a home, an office, a stage, and a public museum. And we're talking about chefs and ushers and electricians and florists and landscapers. Um, they'll work at the White House for multiple administrations and oftentimes their stories or the records of their work can really go a long way in giving us a much fuller picture of what truly happens at the White House. Um, which brings me to this image um, that I'm showing on this slide. This is actually from the Henry Holler collection, an image that we recently obtained. Uh, this is uh, White House staff on the steps of the Eisenhower Executive Office Building wishing President Reagan, um, Press Secretary James Brady, Secret Service Agent Tim McCarthy, and uh, Police Officer um, Thomas Delante um, a speedy recovery after the attempt on President Reagan's life. So if you kind of look in the picture here, you can see there's some chef's hats, um, pointing up, I think in the, one of the ones in the upper right corner is, uh, is Henry Holler. Um, we also, in the same scope of White House, House workers, we also talk about the enslaved individuals um, that work in the White House, uh, or that worked in the White House. Bring me to my next slide, where we'll talk about Paul Jennings. Um, 
Paul Jennings worked in the White House as an enslaved individual, and he kind of exemplifies the multifaceted nature of the White House story. Uh, he was an enslaved manservant and valet to President James Madison. Um, he played a vital role in the saving of the famous Gilbert Stuart portrait of George Washington that is hanging in the East Room. Um, a lot of people may have heard the story, oh, you know, Dolly Madison saved this, this painting. Well, it was really Paul Jennings and a number, number of other free and enslaved workers in the White House who, you know, did the heavy lifting of that work and really got that painting off of the wall and got it out of the White House, you know, at the direction of Dolly Madison. So there's a much larger story to that. Um, Jennings uh, was actually eventually purchased by Daniel Webster who allowed Jennings to work for his freedom. Um, Daniel Webster was also living in the White House neighborhood of that time. And after Jennings worked for his freedom, he kind of stayed very connected to the White House. He stayed connected to Dolly Madison and he stayed connected to the White House neighborhood. And he's this person who just kind of comes in and out and in and out, in and out of the White House story um, over and over. Uh, which brings us to our, my final slide here. Uh, which is something that we've been working on at the association over the past year. Our historians in particular have been working very, very hard on this, which is the Slavery in the President's Neighborhood Initiative. Um, this launched a couple months ago and it examines the complicated past and the paradoxical relationship between slavery and freedom in the nation's capital. Um, this effort kind of stemmed from Michelle Obama's quote she made in 2016 saying, I wake up every morning in a house that was built by slaves, which was true. In the initial construction of the White House, um, there was a lot of work done by free and enslaved African Americans as well as others. Uh, so the SPN, as we call it, um, there's a lot of original research in there. There's a lot of, a lot of very interesting articles. Um, there are very few written accounts uh, of, of slavery in the White House. And our historians have um, worked with descendants. They have looked at bills of sale. They have looked at purchase orders. Um, they've really, really done a lot of in-depth original work uh, to help piece together this, you know, almost forgotten, almost ignored story um, uh, of enslaved persons working in the White House. Um, I link to the full website here. Uh, and also it's worth mentioning too, um, our headquarters on Lafayette Square in the Decatur House, the historic Decatur House, actually has a building attached to it that is an urban slave quarters and it is pretty well preserved. And it's one of the last uh, you know, remaining uh, pieces of evidence of urban slavery in Washington DC or in the country for that matter. And it is, you know, it's, it's a stone's throw from the White House. And, you know, if you're ever able to come down and visit us or have the opportunity to visit yourself, it's definitely worth something uh, checking out to, to really understand, you know, slavery was taking place right here at the president's doorstep and, and, you know, in the White House. The last thing that I've linked on this slide is a virtual tour of the slave quarters of the Decatur House. So if you're unable to come in person or if you'd like to share it with your students, you can follow that link and we actually have 360 degree panoramas um, of the kind of three rooms of the slave quarters with interactive features and you can get a better look and feel of, of what that space is. Um, so I'm going to wrap that up there uh, for my little portion and I can leave it on this slide and, and, and turn it back over or stop sharing my screen. <laughs> um, I mean, I just wanted to say, yeah. you know, also thank you teachers for kind of all you guys do and everything. We're basically here to help and support you guys. So this is all of our contact information. Um, feel, feel free to contact us anytime. I mean, we're working remotely, mm -hmm. but we're, we're still working, you know, normal business hours and stuff. And so Lynn, turn it over to you for questions. Excellent. But I'll just mention too, what we're going to do is we will take the, we will take the PowerPoint slides with all the hyperlinks and we're going to post them to our teaching history virtually landing page along with the video a little later this afternoon. So that'll be there. All right, it's my favorite time of day. It's question time. So we'd love to hear questions you have. Go ahead, put them in the question box, whether they're about resources, about strategies. I would say I love getting stumped. Um, and <laughs> we get stumped from time to time, but when we do, we look it up and we'll email you later this afternoon. We did a couple of those last week. So Ashley, do we have any good questions sitting here waiting in the queue to get started? 
We do. We have a couple, and I'm sure that more will appear as time goes on. But for let's start with Stephen's question today. So Stephen said his school district only allows uh, students to do 20 minutes of work a day. Okay. Um, and he has uploaded four to seven minute videos that students can watch. Um, and he's dealing with uh, one year of the Civil War per week. So for you. This is a challenge here. Um, and he's struggling with the limited time that students are allowed to work each day and would like to know if any of you have uh, quick activities that would require a limited amount of research on the student's part so they can keep within that 20 minute time frame. I'll throw an idea. Okay, if you, obviously we want students to research. We're history day, we encourage research, that's our game. Um, I think sometimes when we have limited amounts of time, what we've got to do is mix it up. So maybe some days are the video with a question or response piece. Then maybe the next day is a question. But what I might do is rather than if I only have 20 minutes to send, and I'm not sure the age of your students, I don't know that I'm going to send an eighth grader to research for 20 minutes because it might take them 20 minutes to get started. Instead, what I might do is direct them, cut out the time of finding and maybe help direct them to one or two cool sources. Or what I might do, I might, this is where these primary source collections can be really helpful, whether they're at White House Historical, at Merit, Presidential Libraries, maybe look at some of those examples that I put up about um, Iran hostage. In that I might say, okay, I want you to go to this site and I want you to do, go to this resource to do this task. But I'm kind of a believer in experiential learning in that if I send you to a page that has 10 resources and I'm asking you to go to one of them, I know there's a chance you might sneak around and look at some of the others if I've hooked you into thinking it's interesting. So I would put up opportunities like that. I would also maybe put up opportunities where I might give students choice to say, okay, you know what, I know we can't do all of it. So instead, I'm going to ask you in your 20 minutes today to do one of these three tasks. And then maybe what I might do is say, okay, you know what, we have two days and I have three tasks. On Monday, I want you to pick one of them. On Tuesday, pick another one. You can skip the third one because now all of a sudden students have some choice. So I think whenever they are looking at something in history, they've got to respond in some way. So are they writing? Are they responding to a question? Are they drawing something? Are they recording something to post back? Can you give choices? Again, it all depends on the technology you're dealing with. And when in doubt, keep it simple. Um, that's what I would say for 20 minute activities. I would think of it like a homework strategy. Here you go. Here's your thing. Have fun. And realize when you're looking at your content, like the Civil War is massive. You're not going to be able to do all of it. You're doing a highlights tour and that's okay. Cherry pick the events or the people that you think are most interesting and exciting and will engage your students the most and realize that they're not going to get every battle and that's okay. All right. Yeah. Kenny, any other suggestions to throw out there? I was just going to mention, I know that we have one of our historians a few years back did a kind of picturing life at the White House and it was about Tad Lincoln, um, Abraham Lincoln's son and kind of that perspective of maybe, I mean, contemplating what would it be like, you know, reflective piece of watch that three minute video and be, you know, reflective about what would it be to live through that. Maybe not even at the White House, but I think that kind of the experience of living through a crisis the kids are kind of experiencing right now. And so I think that's a really relatable connection um, for the Civil War, especially if you're trying to go through it all and stuff. Those dates and those battles are not going to stick in their brain. Um, but some of kind of that experience and what it means to kind of go through the Civil War might. So it's just a suggestion. Yeah. All right. What else do we have, Ashley? We have some more um, content questions. One that I am going to kind of uh, field Whitney and Ken's way because it is about uh, what's available in their archives. So Sharon says, I'm curious if the White House archives have some information documentation on the Gorbachev Reagan connections um, and how can they direct, uh, how can she direct students to locate this information? Um, we have, I mean, you can Google that on, or not Google that, but okay. You know, search it. type it yeah. in the search yeah. bar um, yeah. <laughs> for our digital library. I mean, we definitely have images of um, Reagan and um, his, you know, both his life and also doing, you know, kind of diplomatic stuff there. 
Um, we don't have a ton on that, but I'd also say you should go to that Sharing the White House um, website, click through that, find Reagan, and I bet it will take you one thing to the Reagan Library, um, which is a great resource and stuff. And I know they have some um, really good things on that website too. So again, you can click through all of that. Um, Ken, I don't know if you have any other suggestions. I, I was just gonna say, we had mentioned the Henry Holler things, and um, I know that going through our digital library with a lot of the recent images that were uploaded there from the Henry Holler collection, there are a lot of very, very candid views um, of the Reagan administration uh, that are quite interesting to, to look through. Um, so, so those are all available on the digital library as well. I've also found too, so many of our kind of education teams in museums across the country want to help teachers. So if there's something you're looking for, or maybe students are, you know, looking to fill that last piece on their NHD exhibit board, and, you know, they're looking for something particular, they've heard of something, but they're trying to find an image of it, I would reach out. These, you know, when you go to these individual places like the Reagan Library, you've got specialists there who know that collection, know what's digitized, know what they can have access to. Right now, for a lot of them, their limitation is their access to their facility, but if they have it, what I found is that they're more than willing to share or potentially connect you with somebody who could help you. And I would say it never hurts to ask. The worst someone's going to tell you is no. All right. I have a question from Kristen. She says, I'm a world history teacher, so I'll only be looking at international relations for the most part as it relates to the presidency. What would you recommend using for international relations? Um, we have a um, resource packet that's diplomacy in the White House. Um, and in general, I would say um, the ideas of looking at state dinners, I mm -hmm. think are really interesting and fascinating of that they'll serve dishes that are particular to that country. Um, and so I think there's a lot that you can get from there of looking at that kind of how the world comes to the White House at times and how the White House accommodates that. Um, we also have great friends at the Museum of American Diplomacy at the State Department. And I know that they have some great stuff on their website as well. Um, and I think that's a really kind of interesting aspect is kind of thinking about state dinners, our Secretary of State, um, and kind of those relations. Um, anything else can you have? that you've come across? No, just, you know, highlighting your point that, you know, there's so much diplomacy that happens at the White House that isn't a discussion, that isn't, you know, the two sides or whatever sitting down and speaking to each other, but it is through decorations and it is through art and it is through the foods chosen for a state dinner. Well, I would also throw out too, with you mentioned the National Museum of American Diplomacy, similar to how the White House Historical Association is looking kind of beyond the first family to the people who work and do the day-to-day -day work at the White House. Mm -hmm. They're also doing a lot with looking at the embassy officials. So Americans who go abroad to promote economic, social, political interests, and then the interactions with the embassies that come to the United States. Um, so I think there's a lot of really interesting ways there. Um, I know one of our challenges at History Day is getting more for our world history teachers and we keep pushing right one of our challenges is that most of our national partners are national american partners of one sort or another but the world is interconnected and you can use one resource to get to another resource uh pretty easily and with more that's being digitized even more is becoming available and coming online all right all right, next question from Louise. She says she works with sixth graders. Anything that's really going to work in terms of primary sources about those 13 colonies she has to teach about? What do you think? Do you want to start with anything that you all have? I know this is kind of a little after your collection. We can throw yeah. mm -hmm. this as well. Okay. Oh, oh no, um, sorry. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I mean, Unfortunately, with the 13 colonies, they're a little before us. Uh, mm -hmm. The White House started being built in 1792 and stuff. So for us, we don't have that. But again, um, looking at George Washington or any of the founding fathers, I mean, they have some really strong things of looking at that. If you're looking at Mount Vernon or Monticello, um, they have some really interesting perspectives and looking at there. Um, so also, I always just 
I, I like to teach about the Articles of Confederation because we always forget that. So that's my only plug for them. <laughs> Can I throw out three other resources that might be helpful for you? Um, I think the, a lot of early America stuff, the Library of Congress is really good with that stuff, um, you know, because they have some of the earliest collections of things that were saved. I would also suggest uh, two organizations out of Philadelphia, the National Constitution Center and the Museum of the American mm -hmm. Revolution are really good. But then I would also tell you to take a peek at some of the state historical societies from those 13 states, because often a lot of that early work was saved and preserved and cataloged there. I know we've done some work with the Massachusetts Historical Society. They sponsor NHD in Massachusetts, and they have a good bit digitized from this time period. So I would kind of start looking at those places as well. And again, if you're looking for something specific, email their ed contact and ask, because you never know what they have or things that maybe they have digitized that they haven't gotten up yet that they might be able to share with you. All right, uh, next question from Chris. I will soon be teaching Watergate uh, in my US history class. Uh, what types of resources would you recommend for that virtual unit? Always a fun topic to teach. Ken, do you want to take this one? <laughs> Hold on. Uh, oh, hang on. <laughs> I was trying to get back to the question, but I, clo I closed that question panel. Um, I mean, to, to, to heart back on the uh, collection of presidential sites material, um, you know, that we've put together, we have um, linked there a whole lot of sources of everything Nixon related. So you would be able to go in there and you would be able to um, find all sorts of the you know, other other sites um, covering that. But then on our side, it's the same thing. I mean, if you, you dig into um, searching anything Nixon or getting onto our digital library and looking for those things, um, you'll, you'll be able to find a little bit. Um, and then from not our stuff, but I remember maybe a year ago or something, there was a podcast that came out um, that kind of dug into Watergate. And now I don't know, I can't tell you what it is, unfortunately, but um, I remember it being really interesting of kind of, I think it was like burnout or something. I don't know. Do you guys know this at all? Anyone who's on, you got, for you? I am sure one of our teachers probably knows yes. exactly what you're um, And they can all and they report readily that. typing it in. <laughs> but I was going to say, you know, um, looking at kind of a podcast even of like, you know, obviously screen it yourself, but I found that, you know, those bits and stuff are really kind of fascinating. Also, your students then hear someone else's voice. Um, if you tell them, hey, get a chance to listen to this. And so, um, yeah. Look up. It was a podcast. It was about Nixon's Watergate and stuff, and it was really fascinating. It was the first uh, season of it. The second season was about um, Clinton's impeachment. So if you're teaching either of those things, I know those were um, podcasts about a year ago. Craig says you might be thinking of Slow Burn, the podcast. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. There yes, we go. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Craig. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Thank you. <laughs> I would also throw out, check out the video we did last week with the National Archives, since the National Archives takes care of the permanent records of the federal government, and their docs teach resources, basically their education teams mm -hmm. and saying, hey, this is the best of our stuff for the classroom. I know you can find resources there, um, between there and uh, the Nixon museums and libraries, that I think those would be the go-to places to get the best stuff. Also throw out one other podcast uh, from the Bush Library, a podcast called Ladies First is about the first ladies. Really interesting and not terribly long. They're good little 12, 15 minute segments. You might find some of those interesting. I love podcasts and there's some ones that I listen to that are good, but sometimes they can be like an hour or two hours long. And that's great, but that's not really useful in the classroom. But when you can find ones that are 12 minutes, that could be really useful. And there's a lot of cool ones out there. I find it's a little bit of a rabbit hole once I start getting into that. <laughs> I like it and students like it because they can, rather than reading, they can listen while they do other things. And we want to encourage them to do that. And there are also a lot of options for world history teachers out there too. So definitely check into podcasts of all kinds. Lynn, this next question is geared a little towards you. I think Diane is thinking ahead a little. She has asked, would the NHG theme of communication work with the White House, uh, work with the way the White House creates state dinners to promote cultural diplomacy? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, I think one of the things, if you go to nhg.org slash theme book, we not only have the current theme information, We've posted next year's theme narrative, so it's a sneak peek of our new book that's coming out in June. 
And I think we look at communication all different ways because we have to look at different forms of communication. It's not just the telephone and the television, but those are obviously important in White House history. But I also think it's about, the, we talk a little bit about in the narrative about how communication is a two-way street, right? It's not just about what I say, but it's how Whitney hears me and how she responds to the things that I say to her. And I think so much of White House history is about that back and forth whether you're talking politically, socially, economically, mm -hmm. diplomatically. When we think about kind of the roles of the president, right? Chief, uh, chief of staff, chief executive, all of those have that kind of push and pull communication elements. So again, our themes are really big and broad and they're designed to be so intentionally because we want students to find an area of history they're interested in and say, oh, what are some ways that communication plays into this? So whether you're looking at political communication or military communication or communicating ideas or trends in art and music, there's so many different options. And that's one where I think, I think sometimes when you first see it, you get the thought that it's limited. But when you really start to kind of peel back the layers of the onion and think about it, there's a whole lot more. So you can check that out. We're doing that as a sneak peek. And as we mentioned, starting April 1st, History Day students, if you want to start on your 2021 projects, go to town. We're excited to see what you produce, and we are hoping to see you all live. We're so excited to be doing the virtual contest this year, but we are hoping and crossing our fingers to have you back live in Washington next summer. All right, I know we're going to start to push on time, so I think we have time for one more question, but what I'm going to do while we do that question is just put up a little note. Uh, we definitely have one more session scheduled next Friday. We're gonna work with the Library of Congress with their teacher in residence, and we're gonna focus on the idea of exceptional learners. So we're gonna be looking at both gifted and talented learner strategies, and also strategies for students with learning disabilities or special needs of one sort. This is a really challenging one. This is something that I'm really doing a lot of research to kind of wrap my mind around and come up with some specific strategies for you. So we're gonna be talking about that next Friday if you wanna join us. But I think we probably have time for maybe one more question. And if there's others in the queue, don't worry, Ashley and I will work together and we'll get you responses later or we'll work with uh, Whitney and Ken to get you a good response later. So Ashley, what, which question should we wrap on today? All right, we have one more in the chat that just came through about all of these podcasts we've kind of been suggesting um, and how to know which ones have are, are using good and reliable sources and that the information that they're presenting to their audiences is really reliable. Um, so if you guys could weigh in on that, I think we can we can end there and and get everyone off to the, the rest of their Wednesday. Well, let me throw out one idea and then I want to hear what you all are thinking as well. I think we have to go back and look at the source, look at who's creating it, right? So podcasts that are coming off places like presidential libraries or the White House Historical Association or the National Archives or the Library of Congress, that says, okay, somebody, this is an institution which means somebody is editing this and vetting this and checking for accuracy. When you have a podcast by an individual, that's where I do a little more research because individuals vary in quality, right? This person might be a world recognized expert on the, this particular topic or time period of history. So I would look to see, have they written other books or articles? What's their job, right? So if their job is they're a professor of modern American history at XYZ University, then I think that's a little more reliable than this is just a random person. Look at the person's website, right? This is a digital world. We all have a digital presence of one sort or another. If something seems fishy, if something feels like they're putting out an agenda, I mean, the cool thing about podcasts is that there's a very low barrier of entry. It takes a little bit of equipment and about $200 in licensing, and you can be up and you can be out there. But I think that's a good way to look at kind of who's the person or people behind it, because I think that helps you determine reliability pretty quickly. Uh, Whitney or Kim, what other things might you add? Uh, well, I was just going to add that, I mean, I think that Slow Burn one, it's made by Wondery or one of those big podcast companies. Um, and I think, for one thing, you can look them up. And I, I think the other perspective, though, is that it is about entertainment to some degree. And I think teaching your students that some information, um, whether it's a movie or a podcast or something, maybe has historical content in there, but it's also about entertainment and understanding how to kind of read that. Um, 
that might be too much to do, you know, remotely, but I think that's something to keep in mind in kind of anything we're doing is that some of it is about entertainment and some of it, um, maybe it's all historically accurate, but they have kind of really highlighted one source and there's, you know, 10 other sources that can back that up or something. Um, but definitely a lot of those big podcast companies do have researchers and you can definitely look at what they've done. If you don't feel like they've done enough research, you know, that's fine. But I kind of echo Lynn's sentiment of, you know, especially there's a lot of these institutions like White House Historical or the NAR, you know, places that are making their own podcasts. And I think um, those are clearly, they're coming from good, accurate sources that are being kind of vetted and edited and stuff. So. Yes. I also suggest just doing a little research into them. You can tell which ones have kind of kind of risen to the top because they've won those awards for kind of um, best educational podcast or best research podcast. So that's going to give you that kind of idea and it's going to fund you towards those other podcasts that are really going to give you that, that kind of level that you're looking for with your students. Absolutely. And I love podcasts. I would just say, just like anything you would put out and write it, you've got to listen to it first. Some of them are more written for adults, so they might have language or content that wouldn't necessarily be appropriate for your eighth grade audience because they're trying to appeal to an adult audience. So I would look for that and I would just make sure if you make sure you listen start to finish and listen not as yourself, but listen as the parent of that eighth grader. And if you're comfortable and so much of it is out there that's so good and it's a cool emerging field. And our students once they, you know, I think a lot of times they're a little hesitant to start. But once they get into it, they really like it and they get a different voice and a different accent. And I think those can be really powerful and really interesting. All right, I, we're gonna pause it there because we're just hitting our hour mark. I wanna say a huge thank you to Whitney Hayne and Ken O'Regan from the White House Historical Association. We appreciate you joining us with the Teaching History Virtually series. And we've got one more show that there might be one more in the works. Uh, so keep your eyes tuned. Uh, keep your eyes on your email. We'll let you know about that. But we appreciate all you're doing for your students. Remember, be flexible with your students. Be kind to yourselves. Hang in there. Wash your hands. Try something new in education and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.